focus on, on sustainability, I want to spend the next 20, 25 minutes thinking about inequities. I think the other part of evaluation that I think as a field evaluation has done badly is when we say something is working, we generally mean things on the average. We're not bringing as serious a lens on issues of inequities. Remember, many of our public health interventions are created in the first place to ensure that they reach the people who need it the most. And it's vital that from an evaluation lens, we sort of ask ourselves, is this actually happening? And so I'm going to take a focus on health inequities. I'll be actually taking an example of Scotland, which is where I did some of my most important health inequity work. My example is not relevant. What's more relevant is your own context. And right away, I want you to start off thinking about an intervention or a set of interventions that you are working on that address a specific problem. But I want to be more specific than that, the inequity component of that problem, where you say for maternal mortality, there are huge differences between how the rich and, and the poor how, what are you planning to do? Next slide, please. Uh, so fundamental question, and I think, Michael, you set the stage beautifully. Uh, I'm going to unpack, when somebody says, Ever, we have evidence for this, you've got to be challenging. What's this evidence you have? Uh, how good is this evidence? But the question I want to ask you is for the work you are doing in your community, and this is where, Ivan, that's why I really valued our discussion yesterday, where you're trying to make a difference on issues of, of problems of inequities, and you sort of realize people that need, often reaching them is so hard, as the, was the narrative of the story. If somebody says, Ivan, your program is not working, or is working, what's the evidence you actually need on that? But more generally, other kinds of evidence. What do you need? to do your job better? And how can an M monitoring and evaluation system help you do your job? And that, for me, is the question that Sampaji needs to hear. That's the question Shalendra ji needs to hear. And Shalendra is also thinking about how we build evaluation capacities. And it's vital for me that we also address this very question at the highest levels, too. I again repeat, I worked in many countries for the most part, when evaluators talk about evidence, they are talking about average differences. They are not talking about the needs of the people who need it the most. Continue. So this is a slide from, from a famous report that Michael Marmot wrote in 2005 on social determinants of health. That led to a major work in the World Health Organization. But here in this case, is inequities under five, mortality. Uh, across different countries, you can see the differences in mortality rates between the poorest fifth as well as the richest fifth, and you can see the patterns replicate itself even more starkly in India. Okay. All right, next slide. Uh, Meghalaya, look at the difference, and you can see both differences between states as well as differences within a state. So Meghalaya, rural is 33.6, urban is 23.4. Compare Meghalaya to other states, it's so. So in this case, we are talking about rural versus urban inequities. You can have a range of different inequities. This is just to tell you a quick story in shorthand. There's socioeconomic. There could be a whole range of other things. But even within Meghalaya, continue. Uh, look at the, this is now we are getting into the social determinants of health. Look at, and this is again a slide I stole from, from Pro Professor Albert this morning. Uh, <clears throat> when the mother's schooling com completed is nil, the neonatal mortality is 30.9. When it's 10 or more years, it drops to 10.8. Okay. Uh, uh, so you get the point. The point I'm making is that even this one graphic really sets out an agenda of your life's work to how you address this, how you can reach and make a difference in the lives of women who have, who have less than 10 years or less than or nil, nil, in a way that can make sure that we reduce the inequities is going to require intense collaboration between departments of health, departments of education. And this is where San, Professor Sandra very briefly mentioned on health in all policies. How we collaborate and how evaluation can help such collaborations. 
monitoring can help, is the need of the hour. And so as you design systems, Sampaji, the issue is not some grand evaluation report, some bloke from the Gates Foundation or some bloke from the World Bank has to say. How are you helping your local communities develop better programs in richer ways? And that's where the beautiful connection to PDI comes in, where you are not thinking about one size fits all right from the front, but the need to make inequities explicit is missing throughout. And in Canada, we talk a good game itself. I don't think we take it that seriously. Continue. So I have three questions for you. And I'll just take, I'll pause and get quick responses. So my question for you is, what are you doing to respond to your challenges in health equities in your district? And Ivan, fair notice, I'll come to you first. I'll just focus on an example. This is, I want to get a little bit of a conversation started. But I'm, I want to hear from other districts itself too. So. The question is when somebody says, Ivan, I, I have found that this great intervention is fantastic for this, this, for, for this social determinants of health from England, would you implement it? Is that enough? What kinds of evidence do you need before you say, let's go thumbs up for this? Before you can say to somebody, I don't agree. I think we need this. How do you have those conversations where you stand up for no, I'm not a part of a workshop like this is too, for you to become better consumers of evidence and don't accept just because a position, some great expert from any university, from any foundation, Gates or otherwise, says, uh uh, it's you who is in charge of your local context. And this notion that is something called terrific evidence, and yours are just anecdotes. No, no, no. You're, I think we've got to empower communities to develop such evidence and part of the monitoring and evaluation systems that I am hoping that Sampath Kumarji and Shalindri are empowering is to develop that evidence over time. But you've got to stay true to that belief. And three, and this is where the dinner conversation came. What's the local context? And we spoke, I was really amazed when you spoke about how reaching 30 households, originally you said 30, 30 villages is hard. And he said, no, no, I mean 30 houses is hard. I thought this is important. This is really important and it's really critical. When some national body sends, sets up metrics of what requires performance, how do we incorporate such notions of heterogeneities of context in a very serious way? It doesn't make sense if in Delhi you can reach 30 houses in a couple of hours uh, and compare that. Again. So I think how do we build that? That is the, the stuff of what good evaluation should be generating, not just simply programs work or not. I'll just, go, I'll just come to listen to a couple of voices. Iman, why don't you get us started? Thank you so much, sir. Sir, regarding these inequalities uh, in the district, I can just cite one, two examples from the maternal because that is very close to my heart, maternal and child health. So um, we were having this uh, in 2020 when the COVID pandemic started and we were the only district in the entire country to have this uh, JE campaign. So in spite of the COVID, we had to undergo the JE campaign. So at that point of time, when uh, to one of the refusal villages that was somewhere in Dalu block and the Purakasya PHC. So we went to that village and later I came to know there was one maternal death so I planned my visit that way. But to reach to that village uh, where the maternal death of a teenage mother happened, I had to cross four streams and we have to walk for nearly two hours. So by the moment we reached there uh, and we sat with the family to do the maternal death verbal autopsy. Uh, I realized uh, of a teenage uh, young girl of 17 years. Uh, I realized that when we were doing the autopsy, we realized that the mother who was answering to the questions was seven months pregnant. She was the mother of, she was going to give uh, birth to the ninth child. And she recently lost her third daughter who's a teenage mother. And after I realized that those areas are totally cut off, uh, it is, was very difficult for me also to reach. The husband was also having some medical problems. So I realized at that point of time that no, we have to save this mother. MDR for the teenage mother was on, 
But I knew that I had to save this mother also, otherwise we are going to lose a mother of another eight and the newborn. So I asked the medical officer that at that point of time, we are going to transfer the mother because she cannot bear with the household work and the looking after the newborn whom her daughter has left. And she herself was pregnant for the ninth time. So immediately next day, we arranged for a vehicle from the PHC halfway and we asked the villagers to somehow transport the pregnant mother. We kept the mother for around two and a half months at the PHC in Purakasia. And in December 2010, she delivered a 3.5 kilo baby. She was with us. Of course, regarding inequities, when I'm talking about here is that we need to we cannot, I cannot just ask that they should come to a delivery for save. We have to see to the local problems and solve accordingly. So we brought the mother and the issue with at that point of time was how do I feed two and a half, for half months the ration. So my deputy commissioner then, Sir Ram Singh was kind enough. I keep on keep on asking him for the rice, the dal and all the rations and somehow we manage and that is how the we started with this concept of identifying the high risk and putting them. Uh, another issue uh, regarding which I was telling Sir yesterday was that uh, regarding this adaptive and technical. We had a hepatitis B pregnant mother, a primary, hepatitis B positive. And initially, um, Madam and all will agree to it, we are supposed to deliver them at the institute. But on June, when we had this heavy backlash uh, floods everywhere in West Garo Hills, I was informed midnight that the mother has gone into labor. And I, the vehicle cannot be sent because the streams have swollen up. And it was very risky for the mother to be brought. So we had to take the decision then. So I asked the medical officer, please send our teams. Let them wear PPE cross with the stream with the help of the villagers. So they traveled midnight, crossed the stream, on wearing a PPE, they conducted a delivery. So these are something sort of a PDI, why, 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 why we are solving, but that is not documented. No, these are such meaningful stories, not just in terms of anecdotes, but in the way we think of systems. Uh, you cannot have better health systems without in ways of documenting these stories and then sort of saying, now how do we create a system that is aware of the differences in context and provides supports in a heterogeneous way to accommodate that? And I think that is the stuff of what Emeliza. Uh, I'm gonna go to Ashish and Sandra, I want you to also chime in. Can you go to the previous slide, please? Yes. No, the previous where we chose uh, geography, Kerala. Yeah, yeah, Kerala. Yeah. So two points that I want to open for debate and discussion sometime during the day is many a times RCTs are looked as the gold standards for evaluation. And does RCTs in a health or social context actually are valid? And to a what extent? Because two things one can look at is if you go to the previous slide, which talked about education gradient and a drop in percentage, then to do a effective RCT, you have to wait for two decades. And second one question that comes in is you do a RCT in Kerala or Tamil Nadu or JNK and then use that evidence as transportable evidence across the country. And that's a question and debate may or may not be for this discussion, but it is an important point. Uh, it's a super important point. Uh, and you'd be glad to know that you will not have to wait too long. Uh, or, or perhaps not a debate, at least to hear which side of the fence I on. Uh, we, the debate may take much of time. Senator, any quick thoughts? You've been thinking about these issues. Uh, any other comments from districts in terms of these issues? Okay. Uh, any other? Somebody? You can go. Okay. Uh, so let's keep it moving. Uh, go back to the. Let's see. Yeah. So 
I think, and this is the, I want to connect you to the PDIA. I have found discussions on local context take time to surface. Often it's these avenues where you're having a beer together, or, or, or in this case, at least at one part of the table, uh, pineapple juice and watermelon juice and beer. Uh, uh, things surface. It's not informal discussions where local context surfaces. I think too much of the evaluation field has not taken such stories seriously. In our rather pretentious divide between qualitative and quantitative, that story is profoundly important, not just for performance, but for actually understanding how you need to plan. And our notions of performance, you should not be somebody who climbs 400, uh, runs one kilometer on a flat surface needs to be rewarded slightly differently from somebody who runs one kilometer on Mount Everest. Uh, and I don't think our performance metrics do a good enough job of accommodating that. And it's stories like this we need in the SDG debate in terms of saying we, when we get a little grand about target setting, et cetera, to actually incorporate that. Next, continue. Next slide, please. So keep it moving. And this is your quest, your, the second of your points, Ashish. Uh, B, and this is where I'm sp I want to empower you to say, take Ashish, challenge evidence. Something that works in Southampton. There was a, there was, there was a cricket reference there uh, when I was, did the original slide. Uh, India lost the world, world Cricket Championship there. But anyway, that's a story for another day. But, but the point I wanted to make was uh, what works in Southampton most likely, most likely might not work in Kanpur. And it, here's worse. What might work in Kanpur might not work in Nagpur. So it's not some grand west versus east and all that kind of stories. It's the nature of context. What might work in District 1 in Meghalaya may not work in District 2. And the point is, as part of your work, Sampaji, to empower people to say, that's great, but tell me more about the context of evidence. Ashish's question, how do you know you can move something from Kerala to Meghalaya is fundamental. It's also fundamental to Michael's work, some of his more recent work on external validity is exactly an answer to those questions. But I think this is not just about us, Michael or me, like academics blabbering about external validity. It's about empowering folks to say, I'm sorry, show us the proof that this evidence will work in this context and be tough. Don't it doesn't matter what their expertise is, what the university is, what the foundation is. Challenge that. So the idea here is the relevance of relevance. You don't understand what's relevant to my community. I did not understand. Even though Sandra had told me about the geographical distribution, Michael, until last night, oh my gosh, this, the, this, the contexts are genuinely crazy. Different, different, different. So in some sense, it's the relevance of context that matters even more than grand stories of impacts, which is your question too, Ashish. And I think we need as an evaluation community to say what criteria matter, and we have to empower communities to talk more about local context. In the midst of it is something Michael talked about. Uh, it is important, doesn't matter how great your research work is, et cetera, be humble. You are an accidental tourist to my community. I think it's important to remind people that every once in a while. And it's very vital because I think even foundations like ours sometimes empower a certain view of knowledge. I think as you build serious measurement learning, measurement evaluation systems, it starts with empowering communities to say, this is grand, but not for my community. And I think getting to that, continue. So next slide. So this is where again I want to Come back to, we've got to learn from our experiences to say, listen, I did what you guys were talking about Kanpur, what has worked in Kanpur, but let me tell you some horror stories about what actually happened. That kind of documentation is also empowering to kind of say, no, no, we can play the evidence game too. But the idea is, I think it's actually, even that statement, local context matters is not good enough. Local context might be 85 to 90% of things. Actually understanding, incorporating how our interventions fit into that landscape you're describing, Yvonne, is the stuff of, of how we think. That's the hardest part. You cannot simply say it worked in Southampton. Come on, let's make some adaptations. Let's move. No, no, no. I think that's not good enough. And I think we need to be switching it around. 
and this idea that relevance, relevance to your committee commu to matters, and the word truth is, I think, is a bit of a joke. It's somebody else's truth, but that works in terms of impacts, is not merely theoretical. There are too many examples of where doing here, what worked there failed, because of if, if a failure to see what was relevant to success beyond the fact that the intervention has worked somewhere else. That is simply unacceptable. Okay? And I think this theme of this workshop over the two days is the sense it's about context, but it's also about empowering voices to say, you guys are cool, but, and we are welcome to the community, but show me the proof that you understand my local context. That is your question. Continue. So let's take an example from Scotland. Uh, Ian, who's sitting right there at the back, and me were part of this 15, 16 years ago. Uh, the, the Scottish government was implementing a national demonstration project. The idea was how do we make a difference in the, in the health, in terms of the heart health, of folks who are especially living in the poorest communities. Next slide. So just very, sim very simply, the, the idea was they built a register of folks who they could reach, where they try to reach these reach folks living in the poorest communities the, through a multiple set of means. The idea was when folks come in, they go through special screening, they get a special set of services around health coaching, a whole bunch of other interventions. And the hope was if you manage to get people who are not using the health system from the poorest localities, if they start using the health system, you could start addressing health inequities if they start coming at a higher rate. That's a pretty important assumption. Now, I want to talk about the notion of assumption because guess what? Every single intervention that you implement has assumptions built all over the place. If we had more time, one of the lessons I want you to take back is even when somebody says, I there's evidence this intervention works, you've got to ask, tell me what are some of your key assumptions and, and are those assumptions being met under these conditions? So do not buy the evidence game without asking some of these tougher questions. Continue. So let's just take one link in this. The focus was on identifying and reaching the target population. So they sent out letters, there was a lot of community, community work, et cetera. The idea was people will, from these communities would come at a higher rate for a bunch of risk screening related, related to heart disease. Sure enough, this was in 2006. I was happily sitting in my office in Edinburgh. I got a call from the project manager to say, we've spent 20% of our budget on, on reach. Guess what? People who are coming are still from the well-off areas, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, do we spend more resources for addressing reach? Or do we continue the experiment, the scientific experiment as planned? And anybody with half a brain would have said, no, we have to adapt. But guess what? I was part of a rigorous RCT type study. And I gave the completely unethical and unsatisfactory answer, we've got to stay with the protocol. That, in hindsight, is completely unacceptable. So you've got to be adaptable. You've got, but again, they're not easy answers. But continue. So next, next. So what I want you to say is, there's a key assumption being made. Doing all this cool stuff, I can give you 25 pages on all the activities with it. I can, if you're looking like a progress report, you'd be really impressed with all the work we did. But guess what? A critical assumption, one, one word, well, three words, is not being met. Okay. There were assumptions that by doing these all activities, individuals would be empowered to take control of their lives. Not quite kicking in, sorry. So, next slide. So, if you had more time, I would ask you to say, just think of your intervention, whatever it is, in your community. List a few assumptions. I promise you, even over a cup of coffee, you'd be surprised at the, some of the things you'll learn as you start making things more explicit. And you'll soon realize some of your assumptions are on slightly tenuous ground. You don't actually need this great data systems, et cetera. You need to start exploring that in a much more deeper way. Okay, so 
every day in life, when we go from place one to place two, we make an assumption. It takes five minutes to walk from Blueberry Inn to out here. It, it might take 10 minutes to drive from one part of Shillong to another. It might not. Uh, you're not quite in control of that context. You've got to build that into your planning in a very serious way. Continue. So going back to the have a heart Paisley example, that's why I wanted to bring in notions of evidence. And I happen to be in a school of evaluation that was mentioned briefly by Jane, that's what we call realist evaluation. Michael Woolcock is very much in that camp, even though he doesn't identify. But the idea here is incorporating context in a serious way in our thinking about performance. So part of the kind of evidence review we would do is not just the evidence review of the intervention. We'll break up the intervention and say, for reach, what's the evidence out there of if you do these activities, how you reach the poorest people. Turns out the evidence is quite limited, or there's something out there, but what we realize is just by sending letters to people is not enough. You've got to do 20,000 other things. Relationships, exponential, might be the secret, okay, it's, it's the key. So you just cannot come in, a foundation, a lot of development organizations, let's get it done quickly, two year cycle, you're screwed. I think you've got to really sort of say, what will it take? If reach is important for equities, better take it seriously. We'll worry about the screening part later, et cetera. So you as a program implementer, but the evaluator as your critical friend needs to start unpacking that super seriously. And as I demonstrated with Have a Heart Paisley, your report two years later that the program doesn't work is utterly useless. I'm actually saying it's utterly unethical because you had a chance, as I demonstrated in my failing, to do something you didn't. You, you were more in the service of this grand report rather than actually improving lives. And this is critical. Continue. So I want you to start thinking about different kinds of learning. Any evaluation generates very many kinds of learning. It's not like this grand report, here's the rigorous statistical part. No, as a policymaker, as a practitioner, as an implementer, I do care about on a daily basis. And just to have a hard pace the example, continue. So there's a policy learning. Turns out in Scotland, while this was being implemented, the government said, is it a good idea to target the poorest communities? Should we be having a strategy that says, no, we're not just gonna be targeting a few communities. Guess what? There's stigma to it attached to some of this stuff. You cannot just simply say this is a good thing. Or should we be a little bit be more subtle about it? Evaluation provided, Feedback, actually, that's not a bad strategy, but you got to do A, B, C, and D, okay? Two, this is really critical. Have a heart busy that they, they didn't have a clue on how many health coaches do we need. Does a health coach see, see 10 people a day, 20 people a day, 100 people a day? Going back to the R, the relationship. If relationships are important, you better not have 100 people a day. So what people do in planning though, is guess what? It takes about 10 minutes to talk about somebody's health, 15 minutes, and divide eight hours a day by, and you come up with a number. They have not factored in what actually matters. You need to talk shop, you need to kind of have a watermelon juice. That's when the stories come out, et cetera. So how do you actually build that into your organizational structure? Programs fail as I evaluated, not because they were bad ideas, but you didn't plan organization structures to deliver on them. It's super critical. Process learning, what is it about your program that makes a difference? Is it you? Is it the drug you give? Is it the friendships that they feel empowered to come back to the community, et cetera, et cetera? So that's very critical. So the idea that it's processes that matter, how does the evaluation provide knowledge of that? The fourth is sort of weird terms, but actually what I found is we are often implementing and creating programs without actually understanding the lives of people whom we are supposed to be serving. So can you go back to day one and actually start first talking to people, actually understanding there are very many heterogeneous contexts. Even your context was one context within your own community. There are many other houses that have very different, many other areas that have, within your own community have very different contexts. You have to incorporate that up front and evaluations provide a chance to learn that. We need to do a better job doing that itself. And then comes the issue of impacts. It does tell me that it make a difference. But I am saying too far, too much of evaluations focus on that learning. All of the other bits 
we'll commission it to a bunch of people. But at the end, it's not documented in a way that seriously ends up you know, building more seriously. These are just five examples, a whole bunch of other learnings that are possible. Continue. So yeah, go ahead. So here's best challenges that are already referred in, in the earlier part of the discussion. It's not easy for inequities. Change doesn't happen overnight. A funder will come and say, two years is what you've got to demonstrate impacts. Uh, it's going to be hard to actually demonstrate. You may have some initial movement along those lines. And there's a question that was asked of Mel Mark yesterday. Uh, again, the t impact time frame of phenomena might be different from the evaluation time frame. Uh, it's really important that you understand needs of different segments of your population. For this group, I can see a quick impact. Why they already come in quickly, et cetera. For other groups, will take longer. It doesn't mean you shouldn't work in that group because for that group that actually has. So the paradox of evaluation is it gets complicit in reducing services for the very group that needs help the most. It actually means you have to be, in a more iterative way, serving their needs. Again, all of this is really learning, not for a fancy report, not to meet your, your funding requirements, but for action in a, de in a detailed way. A few more slides, and I'll be done. Continue. So partly what I'm arguing for is we've got to change this notion of evidence to thinking, no, 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 for my work, to do my job well, I need a pattern of different evidences. I need process knowledge, I need organizational knowledge. I need to understand people's lives. You can also have a bunch of other things that you think are important. Well, let's unpack that. Continue. Next slide. So go ahead. So yeah, go ahead. So just to give you a few, in the inequity space, you need evidence that helps your own reflections. Learning organizations will meet on a monthly basis to say, Ivan, you've been in the field. Sampaji, you love being a field person. What are you learning about what works? We need spaces to get there. I think evaluation is a role. I'm sorry to say we are not stepping up as a community for this role itself. Too much of our view of evaluation is the grand report. And I think this is why evaluations have to be contextually driven. You can have the expert in Delhi providing you advice, but the work has to happen in those communities. You're not going to be able to do real ref reflection along those lines. Again, effectiveness matters. None of my, I'm not downplaying any of that stuff. That matters, but I'm saying the other, other parts of the ecology have not been stressed enough. I think that's the other thing I want to say. We don't do a jo good job of providing evidence to say actually it's the connection between this intervention and that intervention that we need to do a better job. I like the notion of positive deviance. I would also stress other examples of communities that are do a beautiful job of connecting interventions. That's the kind of lesson we also want to learn. I don't see why we're not doing that. Evidence for reach, super important. If people don't use systems, there might be a good reason they don't. How do we break those barriers? You mentioned stories yesterday, too, about working in some communities. But you going, spending time, and spending a week with certain leaders in the community became profoundly important in reaching individuals who were not using the health system. Those stories matter in our own definitions, our own iterative definitions of, of how we think about interventions, evidence for segments. Super important. Too often, we don't pay attention to what's the unmet need of the community. We start with, there's a cool intervention. Let's implement it in our community. No, no, no. Let's talk about unmet needs, et cetera. Evidence of dif differential impacts. For this group, it has this kind of impact. This group, sorry, it's negative impacts. Wake up and smell the coffee. Do something about it. Again, I just don't see us do that. Again, evidence for sustainability. So partly what I stress, a whole variety are possible. Let me wrap it up the next two minutes. Continue. Yeah. So. This was the district, this was the exercise I do, but I feel I'm keen to keep things moving. But the, what I would have done was take any intervention in your district you've evaluated with a focus on inequities. Ask yourself, do not trivialize the next question. It sounds, it's not, I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to score points, but what do you want to learn? Too often our questions of learning are coming from the funder or some academic. That's rubbish. You've got to say, no, 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 for me to do my job better, this is what I need to learn. I'll address your learning needs. Yes, Mr. Mr. Funder or Mr. Funder, but I'll tell you what I need to learn. I think we need spaces that we can do that. I think PDI promotes, promotes that dialogue. There are other methods of doing that too, but I think we need to take that seriously. Again, I want to connect you to Ashish's talk in terms of what data do you want to ex do you collect to explore the impacts on inequities. Go ahead, please. So I think 
last slide, and I think maybe there's two more slides. Uh, let's go all the way. So there are programs. There's a policy landscape. This is Sampaji's land. Sampaji will talk to Mati and, and Sandra and others to say, what's the evidence? What's the theory? Come up with a program. Then you'll have something called a theory of change. We say, this is by implementing this program. This is how we think things are going to work. Continue. Then you have something called an evaluation. And by that, I mean monitoring, learning, evaluation. You can throw in research. I'm not being, even though I tend to use evaluation as shorthand, I, I'm saying anything goes. But some means to say what's working. But it's important that a whole different kinds of learnings are generated if we do it well. But that learning is still not good enough. The important part, and this is where you come in, Sampaji, this is where you come in, Shell Energy, is how is that learning fed to the Principal Secretary of Health in a way that he can actually align it to this? So it's not that this, he's only interested in what are the impacts of this program. That's one part of his interest. His interests are broader. Are we making the right strategic choices in terms of inequities? How do you kind of align that more broadly? Continue. And I write underneath that alignment moving beyond programs as the unit of analysis. Too often in evaluation, we just think, I get $500,000 to evaluate one program. That's all I'm focused on. The bigger focus I need to have is with these connections you have, how does Sampaji in his office take it at the strategic level? Continue. And then Sampaji will use his interpersonal skills, use his skills to influence certain individuals, perhaps through policies to again change the policy landscape. And that's how the life of an evaluation continues. One more slide and an end there. So I want to end with the slide I started yesterday. And I want to just, and again, you can expand the site, this example of a soup and different groups, different purpose of evaluation. Part of what I wanted to stress in the evaluation part of the course is there's a new view of evaluation. There's not just one school. But the view I wanted to stress was it's not the evaluation report, it's not the evaluator's point of view that matters. It starts with you being empowered to say, here's my learning question. Here are the contexts that matter. You have to take charge. And I'm telling you there's an asymmetry of power here. And too often, we've given up power to the outside, outside group. Or it could be inside group. But I don't think universities, institutions are valued critical friends, critical partners but not fully understanding context, and I think we need to, to do that. So I think thinking about, in the summative case, does it work? In the formative case, can you help me make my soup better? And in the development case, and this is really critical. Many of our problems are serious ones, new ones. There may not be an evidence from Southampton that's gonna fit into your context. That does, that's not cause for despair, that actually is cause for thinking through, either from a PDIA perspective or through other approaches. How do you actually become more sensitive and actually develop a new soup that works in your community. I'll end here. Uh, any questions? I, I wanted to make it more interactive, but I felt we were running desperately behind on time. Yeah. Questions, yes, sir. So Ashish Ji. Thanks, Sanjeev. I don't have questions, but two thoughts uh, related to what you said. One part is to learn, but it is also a significant part of what one needs to unlearn. Because b the reference frame changes not only between spaces, but between time. And there is an endogeneity between interventions and evaluation. So one needs to look at that. And second thing is uh, what you mentioned in your, this current slide about different aspects of evaluation. And I want to leave the thought of looking at participative development, not participative evaluations. Because if you do participative development, you don't need evaluations to what we do of objectifying the subject. Thank you. Uh, I, I like what, what could sound like a provocation, but it's really deep. I think it's, you want to develop a system that you don't actually don't need evaluations. The point being, uh, and I think it's only a small class of interventions that may need evaluations in the first place. But I think both the points uh, completely echo, and your point on unlearning also echoes. 